One of the things we're going to do today, you can go to the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 5, and I want to go back. We're starting a new series today on the Holy Spirit, and I'll tell you, I'm hungry, but I'm not hungry enough. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at. You should always have a certain amount of satisfaction in your dissatisfaction as to where you are with the Lord. I've got a psychologist friend, and I have never heard this word. It's called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, eustress. And that is needed for a healthy life. It's what keeps you moving, keeps you going. But most people move into distress, and that's destructive. And then some people move over into the laziness side. You need a certain amount of pressure to keep you going, but you can't let it get to where it's distress. And so there are things inside each of us. I believe that if we will hunger and thirst after righteousness, the promise is that the Lord will fill us to overflowing, but he will not pour out upon him that is not hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Jesus said, blessed are those that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, and we know that we'll get hungry for more of what we feed on. There was a day I thought I could never live without chocolate ice cream and Lay's potato chips before I went to bed. And you laugh at me, but I am telling you, a day without chocolate ice cream and Lay's potato chips for me was like a day without sunshine. And I could not let the day close without at least one big bowl of what used to be called heavenly hash. And no, that was not marijuana. That was not a, that was not a, you know, if you say that today and live in Colorado, they'd like, "Uh uh-huh. Well, the pastor serving the most high God. But there was this ice cream they used to have, Heavenly Hash, over at King Supers, and it had marshmallow, and I'd just pile a bowl of that and get a whole bag of chips and an ice cold glass of milk. And all of a sudden, I thought one day, you know, I really ought to quit this. I think I'm kind of addicted. And uh, try that. I just thought I could, could not get free of that. But I did. I quit feeding on it. I had to make that first initial little bit of of cutting that off, but you will hunger and thirst, and now I eat things like celery. I used to hate celery. I thought, Lord, why'd you even bother making this stuff? This is terrible. Broccoli, I love it. I love broccoli. When I was a little kid, give it to all the starving children, mom, send it to them. They can have my portions. But you can change what you hunger and thirst for. And you need to hunger and thirst. But anyway, 2019, this was actually December 25th, Christmas Day. I was up early and I was walking. I I just get my old yellow pad out and I'll be walking the floor and the things the Lord, five words the Lord gave me. I've already shared it. I'll go over it. Five words the Lord spoke to me for this year. Number one, attitude. Attitude determines altitude. If you're a pilot, attitude is everything. The same power that will get you over your mountain will plant you six to nine feet in it if the attitude is not properly adjusted. We need an attitude of gratitude, cultivate thankfulness. People say it just couldn't be any worse. Oh, yes, it could. Number one, attitude. Number two, affections. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 3, set your affections on things above. It amazes me. You open the headlines and people give their lives for the worthless. They, they do things, drugs, and, and uh, modify their bodies, and, and all of a sudden, they die from this stuff sometimes. And all this stuff, you know, if you look good today, if you take a picture, because it's going away. <laughs> And we need to understand that we set our affections on the wrong thing so much that they don't satisfy when you get it. Set our affections on things above. Number three, the Word, the Word of God. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Probably one of the more important ones is that one right there. Set your heart. Make it your daily bread. Don't, don't just get in the Bible to get a message or to put in your time and feel better in your conscience. Man, it must become your daily bread. And you remember when we did that series on the Bible? Here's three things. Read, study, and meditate the Word. Reading's important, but that must go into study. Study's important, but you don't really, you're not hitting pay dirt until the meditations of your mind and heart are being affected by the Word. Most books we read inform, the Bible transforms. Because in the beginning was a Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So the Word, number four, witness. Don't dam up the river. Power is actually given to us to be his witnesses. And that Greek word for witness is the Greek word martus. It's where we get the word martyr. We give our lives up for him because he gave his life up for us. We lay our down. Actually, Jesus taught us. He said, if you don't lose your life, you'll never find it. If you try to hang on to your life and not give it up for him, you're going to end up losing it. But if you lose your life for his sake in the gospel, that's when you find it. The fifth thing is the supernatural. Number five is supernatural. I just, I am telling you, the supernatural is no longer optional. You're going to have to have the supernatural in your life. So this series, I don't know how long we're going to go on it, but we're going to get on to the Holy Spirit. The greatest asset you have once you are born again is the Holy Spirit. The fact of it is you could have never been born again without him. You wouldn't have any desire. But he's not an it. He's a who. So, so those things are something you need to keep a hold of. But let's get started in this. I just want to do an introduction today into who the Holy Spirit is. He's not a gas. He's not a cloud. He's not some strange something or other. He is a person. He is the third person of the Godhead. We believe in the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three, yet one. Now that's not difficult to understand because even creation reveals the Trinity in it. You and I are triune beings. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. And so when you see me coming, you don't say, hey, there comes Mark's spirit. Or hey, look, we're talking to Mark's soul right now. Or look, Mark's body just walked into the room. No, you say there came Mark. But if you, any one of us want to know us, you have to understand those three things. But the three are one. And so even in creation, water is a type and shadow of the spirit. Water takes on three form, liquid, gas, and solid. So you can have a chunk of ice, you can have a steam, and you can have water, and they're all three H2O. Time has three components, past, present, and future. And actually, there are some astrophysicists that are born again, and uh, one of them, uh, his name is Hugh Ross, and I remember, he, it's a brain cruncher to read his books, but I forget how many they've discovered or uh, believe there's like maybe 10, 11, 12 time-space dimensions. And when I saw him start to outline that in one of his books, I said, wow, the Trinity's not hard to understand. For instance, how does the Lord know the end from before the beginning? How did Jesus know that Peter would deny him? He said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. How did he know that? By the Holy Spirit. That's called a word of knowledge. And so all of a sudden, Peter gets confronted one time. He denies that he even knows who Jesus is. Gets confronted a second time. This is leading up to the crucifixion. Denies knowing him. I think it was the third time he denied him with cussing, cursing. And all of a sudden, the rooster crowed, and he went, oh. He remembered what the Lord said. What did Jesus say? Peter, before that rooster crows, you will have denied me three times, but I have prayed for you that your faith... Yes. Fail not. So when we talk about 
the Lord. When we talk about God, we are taught, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we are talking about Almighty God. He's not some angel or some diminished presence of God. He is, in fact, part of the Godhead. Now, here's the thing. They are co-equal but different in functions. Co-equal but different in functions. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let's read this now when Jesus started to introduce the fact that he says, I'm leaving and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And let's just get a little bit of the framework. This is leading up. It's not too much longer. Jesus will be taken into captivity. He will be beaten. He will be crucified and he will be buried. So think of how these disciples are feeling. They've had three years with the Son of God. God manifested in the flesh. No one has ever experienced this on the planet. Jesus was and is God. He wasn't 50% God. He was very God of very God. But he was in a body. The Word says, thou hast prepared me a body. He was not created. He was brought forth because Jesus the second person of the Trinity, has never had a beginning. And all of a sudden, he comes, and they had three years together on the earth. They watched the dead raised. They watched thousands of people fed with a little boy's lunch. There was nothing they could be confronted with that the Lord didn't provide everything they needed. One time, he, he taught them about the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, and then he said, let's go to the other side. And a life-threatening storm came. And these were seasoned fishermen. These weren't newbies out there on the water. And they woke up, a perilous storm came. And when you study it, they were in danger. And all of a sudden, they woke Jesus up. Lord, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And all of a sudden, he gets up and he calms the storm. And it says, they marveled. They said, what manner of man is this that the wind and the waves obey him? But he doesn't turn to comfort them. He turns to rebuke them and say, where's your faith? I said we were going to the other side. So here they have seen signs and wonders and miracles, the multiplication of the loaves. The, you know, they needed to pay their taxes. He said, go grab that fish and you're going to find the, how many of you would like that miracle in your life? Glory to God. IRS sends you a letter and the Lord says, go fishing. And you're like, praise the Lord. Ah, oh, there it is right there. Got my whole tax bill paid. I mean, people would hear him teach and they would say, never a man spake like this. And people marveled because they said, he has authority in what he says. He was God in the flesh. And now let's look at what he says next to get them ready for his departure. John 16, verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Well, I guess so. I mean, you're leaving? How many of you know who wants to turn loose of a good thing like that? And then all of a sudden he goes, Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove or convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Now let's go back up to verse 7. Because Jesus, you know, they got to know him by now. Jesus never, never ever lied to them. He couldn't. He never lied to them or misled them or anything, but he had to preface the statement. He says, what I'm about to tell you is the truth. Because already their hearts were getting heavy. They had sorrow in their hearts. He said, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. And that word in the Greek means it's to your advantage. It's more profitable that I leave and go away. Why? Because he said, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. But he said, if I do go, the Holy Spirit will come. And in this same neighborhood of Scripture, he says, now, he's with you, but the day's coming, he shall be in you. And that's the important thing that we need to learn. 
So in verse 9, he says these three things that he's going to do. He's going to convict the world of sin. In verse 9, he says, of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And then in verse 12, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, so for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath or mine Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now here's the thing, church. The Bible tells us study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed. Here's a fact. You and I cannot believe for something we don't have knowledge of. That's why it's so important that we study the Bible. Not just read it. Study the Bible. God will bless you if you will study the Bible. Now, some people, they, they use this thing. Oh, well, you know, I'm not real spiritual and I just don't know much scripture. It amazes me when I hear like football fans that, it, I mean, they're football fans and they start rattling off team scores from the 1970s, starting lineups, coaches that they had, bad calls. And I'm like, how do you remember all that? Real simple. They're passionate. And if you're not passionate about the things of God, then the Bible says, stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. If any of you know how to start a campfire, you know how to be on fire for God, whether you realize it or not. You have to give yourself to it. You have to, you have to realize that, you know, if you never open your Bible to read it and never study it, you'll never meditate it. And the whole key to the Word of God is getting it from that book, the Bible, into your spirit. So let's, let's ask a few questions here and answer them. Who is the Holy Spirit? Some have thought of him as an it or a what, but he is, in fact, the third person of the Godhead. He is a person, okay? And a person, third person of the Godhead, had no beginning, never will have an ending, but just like any person, if you're going to get to know someone, you need to what? Spend some time together. You can't expect to get to know anyone you don't spend time with. When you meet someone for the very first time, you may not know a thing about them. But that's solved when you begin to spend time with them. Well, how do you do that? The primary way is the Word of God. The Bible, I love the power of the Word of God because it's not another book that just gives you information. It is the very power of God, wisdom of God, person of God in print. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Here's how powerful the Word is. I, I love this story. His name was Muhammad and there's a video that I've talked about called Field of uh, More Than Dreams. And it's Muslims that were saved supernaturally in other parts of the world. Something you don't hear on the lamestream media is all the thousands of Muslims getting born again on a regular basis. Supernatural, supernatural interventions, dreams, visions, and things like that. But there was a group of terrorists training out in the Egyptian desert and an imam came to this young man, Muhammad, and said, I want you to read the Bible and, and write down the foolishness of it and the contradictions. And Muhammad was taught as a little boy, don't even touch it. His mother taught him that people that have Bibles are cursed. Christians are cursed because they own a Bible. Yet he had to obey his imam. He had to do whatever he said. And the imam said to read it, to write down, and put all that foolishness, the contradictions down. So he started reading the Bible, and guess what happened? A Muslim training for jihad, training how to slit throats, how to shoot people, how to ambush people in the Egyptian desert, got born again reading the Bible. That is the power of the Word of God. If you will begin to study the Word, power will start coming into you no matter how dark the darkness is in your life. So, 
God has no other means in your life for lifting your life than through his word. The word of God is the means whereby you get your inheritance. He sent his word and what? Healed them and delivered them from their destructions. It's an awesome thing. It's a beautiful thing. There are people that pay the price with their life if they're caught with the Bible. Now, one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is read the book of Acts several times. Just keep reading it. I brought this because in my Bible it says the Acts of the Apostles. And in red ink right above that I put Holy Ghost. It's the Acts of the Holy Ghost through the church. I put exclamation points. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both began to do and to teach. Well, you notice that it didn't say he's done. In fact, I usually tell people, if you have your Bible, turn with me over to the book of uh, Acts chapter 28. Do this real quick. Can anybody find for me Acts chapter 28, verse 32? Acts chapter 28, verse 32. There ain't any. There ain't any. Because it's still being written. Jesus is not done. And there's no first century faith. There's no first century Christianity. There's just faith that Jude told us to earnestly contend for. It's the faith once delivered unto the saints. And the faith of the first century will do the same thing in the 21st century. But we have to fight the good fight of faith. And the Holy Spirit is the one sent to teach you, to lead you, to guide you into all truth and to help you. So who is the Holy Spirit? Some have thought of him as an it or a what, but he is in fact the third person of the Godhead. He's a person. Where does he reside? The Holy Spirit, is he out there somewhere? No, when you are born again, he's inside you. He moves in. That's what Jesus was talking about. He said he's been with you, but now when I pay the price, go to my father, he said he's going to move inside. You will become born again. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is going to reside on the inside of you. And we've got to go back to the original source, the book of Acts. This is what the church is supposed to look like. I love books, but this is the book of all books. This is the only thing that can empower us to do what we're called to do. And this will be a year, and we're starting into a season that is going to be the most supernatural that we have ever seen beginning this year on planet Earth. And quite honestly, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. So, what does he do? What does the Holy Spirit do? He fulfills the ministry of the Lord Jesus through the people of God in a way that is far better than if Jesus were here in his flesh and bone body. Look where he says, verse 7. Look at that. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. It's expedient, more profitable for you that I go away. In other words, think of this. They were on full-time staff with Jesus, traveled with him slept right near him. They came upon a madman of Gadara. Never, I, I've never seen anyone demon-possessed like that, but this man kept a whole countryside in terror. They, they bound him with chains. He broke the chains. He was full of demonic powers, terrified everybody. They come upon it. Can you imagine being there with the Lord Jesus? I'm kind of like, glory to God, get the video rolling. Get your iPhones out. This is going to be awesome. And what does he do? He cast the devils out of that man, legions of spirits. They went into the hogs, the swine, and they, full of demonic force, were run off and drowned in the countryside, freaked everybody out. How many of you know that was the first, bit, first look at deviled ham right there in the whole scripture? <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that in. But it's true, isn't it? (laughs) Think of this. Jesus said, though, I'm going away. It's better for you that I go away. 
And we've seen smatterings of this. I have a friend, he just earned his master's in church history. We're going to have him probably in the month of May teach a course on the supernatural and miracles in the church. And I want to tell you this because there's some people that claim to be scholars and they're not very scholarly in their studies. They say that the gifts have ceased. They say that tongues have ceased. They say that miracles have ceased. No, we have a God of miracles. There never was a day of miracles. We have a God of miracles. We have a God of the supernatural. And so we're going we're gonna to learn some things. We're going to kick over some sacred cows. We're going to kill and slay sacred cows and say, oh, the supernatural, that's only for certain people or that was the Lord that did those kind of things or the early church. No, these signs shall follow them that believe. Do I have any believers in the house today? You're a believer? Signs follow you. Miracles can flow out of your hands. Healing flows out of your hand. We're going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I've got some reading for you to do if you'd like to do it. But the devil has hated this thing called the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I'm being very honest. Some of the most foolish manifestations of the flesh I've ever seen has been among the Pentecostals. And I am... For all intents and purposes, you could put me in the Pentecostal camp. I, I don't like to identify that. I'm just a believer. Yes. I, I'm a believer and wanting. And this is what happened. When I got born again and the Lord got a hold of my life, I was all in. I said, Lord, I want anything you've got. I want everything you've got. I don't care what it is and I don't care what it costs me. So I went around to the, my dear beloved friends at the Nazarene Church because I did not know what tongues was. I didn't know. I, I remember as a little boy in the Lutheran church, we used to color, but it was, it was fire on the top of their head. You know, we had the little cloven tongues of fire. I remember, I remember doing that. But I went to my friends at the Nazarene church because that was the place that the Lord led me at that time. And I asked them about tongues and one person said, oh, that's of the devil. You don't want anything to do with that. Then another person said, oh, that's foolishness. It's gibberish, those crazy Pentecostals. I'd stay away from that. Then another person said, well, it's for some people, but not for everybody. And, uh, you know, God gives it if he wants to and all that. And I found out that's the most confused bunch of people I've ever seen. And, and so I got hungry and I began to read, I began to study and I thought maybe I should talk to somebody that has the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because here's what I've learned in my walk with the Lord. The Bible is so easy to understand. You need a theologian to help you misunderstand it. Are you with me? I mean, they just choke the life out of it and alter it and mutate it and all that kind of stuff. And I said, Lord, so there's a book that I, guys, do you have the book, uh, They Speak With Other Tongues? If you put that up, if you have it. Anyway, we've got copies of it at both campuses because the book, They Speak With Other Tongues by John Sherrill was written by a skeptic. He wasn't even born again initially and he wrote for Guidepost Magazine. And I've got the 40th anniversary for sale because this book was written in 1964. Millions of copies have been sold. The gentleman was a skeptic, John Sherrill. They wrote for Guidepost Magazine, and he said, you know, they called him in, and I think it was uh, Norman Vincent Peale's wife asked that they do an article on those that speak with other tongues. And so he started doing interviews, and he went into it really with a skeptical view and really about tried to disprove it. And he brought people in and they spoke with other tongues and, and they recorded it. And then he had linguists look at it and examine it. And he put two plants in there, his wife and his son. They didn't speak in other tongues and they just began to do this gibberish and they had these linguists that came and looked at it and they said, "There, well, we've gone through all these, but there's two of them that, that it's, uh, it's an imitation. Somebody was trying to fool you. They, they found all that. Long story short, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He just died a year ago, a year and a half ago. He was 94, I believe. His, him and his wife received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And why did I, I wasn't planning on that one this morning, but let me tell you why. I want to tell you this. Because that is your nuclear option. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
There's the book right there. And that's the one you ought to get. There, Southwest, you've got some down there. And then, that, and then there was another book that I recommend called Flammable or Fireproof by Reinhard Bonnke. And let me just tell you this real quick. Reinhard Bonnke has the most wonderful, beautiful spirit. He's from Germany. He has personally seen 77 million people saved. And uh, if you, many of you know Reinhard Bonnke. And that is his legacy right there. And so he was being interviewed on the 700 Club. And uh, Pat Robertson asked him, so Reinhard, where'd you get this, where'd you get this uh, title? He said, well, I was in a meeting and the Holy Spirit was so strong. And he says, I saw the people worshiping, but he said, I saw five people that were like this. And he said, I said, Lord, what is this? And the Lord said, these are asbestos Christians. <laughs> it's an incredible book. Miracles, signs, wonders. I knew a good friend of Reinhard Bonnke, Roger West, a South African, still ministers all through Africa. And I said, Roger, what was the greatest miracles you ever saw with Reinhard Bonnke and the crowds? Because when the power of God hit, signs, wonders, miracles, demons began to come out of people. And he told me the, one of the greatest, there was a little boy, he would always have them come up on the stage and, and he would say, so what has God done for you? And this woman had her little baby boy and pulled his britches down and said, he was both sexes, and God made him one sex. God totally corrected him. Another woman was holding a newspaper, and he said, what has God done for you? And she opens it up, and there was this huge goiter, and Roger said the stench was almost overwhelming. It had come off of her and left baby flesh. And there it was, and he just went on and on. Muslims would try to interrupt their meetings. Witch doctors would do all sorts of things. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to teach and preach the pure gospel because the gospel is not in word only. It is in power, 1 Corinthians 4.20. You don't counsel devils out. You cast them out. You have to cast them out. You don't reason with demon powers. And if there's one thing we need in these days ahead, church, it's the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pull all this stuff open and pull the curtain back so the weirdness dissipates from your thinking. Because God came up with tongues. God came up with that. It's his idea. It's not Pentecostal's idea. It's not the word of faith. It's not the charismatics. It is the spirit of God. And he never does anything without purpose. And I don't know what I would do if I didn't have the baptism and the Holy Spirit in my life. I honestly don't even know if I'd have made it. I had friends of mine that I looked up to, but they rejected it. They pushed it back. And I received it. And people would give arguments and things like that. And I'm going, well, I just told the Lord I wanted everything he's got. And do you know all but one or two of those people from way back then are backslidden or they're not walking with God or doing anything in the ministry? If, if I would have voted anybody least likely to succeed, it would have been me. I just wanted to help. I wanted to serve. But the Lord blessed me and, and gave me that baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's for everybody. So we're going to go down this road. Let's, let's do a couple of things here. I'm a little bit behind on this. So what does the Holy Spirit do? He fulfills the ministry of the Lord Jesus in a greater way. He is the source of all fruit. So number one, let me just share these things with you real quickly. Number one, the Holy Spirit is our number one help in fulfilling our destiny. I'm going to say it this way. You can't do it without him. You and I need his help. We absolutely need his help. He's the number one help in fulfilling our destiny. But now here's something you need to understand. The Holy Spirit does not exalt himself. Look at John 16, verse 13. Jesus said, Howbeit when he 
Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit will not exalt himself. Jesus spoke whatever the Father said. Now Jesus has returned to heaven and the Holy Spirit speaks whatever he hears the Father and the Son say. The secret to the success of Jesus' ministry is he said, I don't do anything except my Father show me. The Lord Jesus himself had a total reliance upon the Holy Spirit. So, number one, he's our number one help in fulfilling our destiny. Number two, any aspect of our relationship with the Lord came about with his aid and assistance. Look at John 6, verse 44. It says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Somebody, you know, I mean, we've all said this. We've all heard it. I found the Lord. Well, first off, the Lord wasn't lost. (laughs) He found us. And by his grace, we responded. Do you know you could have no desire for God or the things of God if it were not for the Holy Spirit? You know, like, think about this. Do y'all have a desire for more of God? I believe God put, guess what? The Bible says that's the Holy Spirit's work in you. It's him that both wills and wants to do his good pleasure. That's a gift. That's the Holy Spirit. And then we respond to that and then things begin to take place. So think about it. He's the one that drew you to the Lord, helps you get saved. He gives comfort. The Lord even identified him as the comforter. If you're like, how many of you know you can have comfort in the midst of absolute insanity in this life? That's why drugs are so big in this world. That's why people are out of control. They're trying to numb the pain. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can truly... When you, when you think of what the devil perpetrates on people, the evil that he perpetrates, only the Holy Spirit can bring comfort to you. Anything else falls so short. Drugs, alcohol, relationships, getting caught up in work, whatever it is. Nothing but God. Nothing but God. He reveals the scriptures to you. He reveals the will of God to you. He helps you pray when you do not know how to pray. He is the empowerment in your life. He is the, the, the means and the source, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the powers of the world to come, function and operate. And let's close on this. Number three, here's what I want to do in this series. Let us learn about him and draw ever closer. Let us learn about him. What did Jesus say? He said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So now here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Jesus said he will teach you. He will lead you. He will guide you into all truth. Can I just say it this way? The Holy Spirit is everything you have ever needed, and he's everything you will ever need. And isn't it funny, we go looking everywhere and yet the help is right here inside of us. You can't find anything or anyone any better anywhere. And yet many people spend their whole life looking and looking and never do respond to God. That's why We need to bear so much fruit. He bears witness with our spirit. He gives us peace beyond understanding and comprehension. He gives us unspeakable joy. He is the perfect gentleman, though. He will never force himself upon you. The Bible says this, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You can make him, you know, like some people say, I just wish God would leave me alone. Be careful because he most certainly will if you stay at that. He will leave you alone, and if he ever does, you're in a world of trouble. 
He must be invited. He must be welcome. James said it this way, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does it mean to be double-minded? Two destinations. One minute you're hot for God, one minute you're cold. One minute you're all excited to serve him, the others you're, you're, you're saying it's too hard, Lord. Listen, he is our strength. He is the strength of our life. And when we get weak, Paul said, when I'm weak, then am I strong. So here's what I want to have you do. Read the book of Acts multiple times because what you see in the book of Acts was not just for the first century. We're going to cover this. It's for now. That's the way it ought to be looking now. And we're headed there. We're going to need the supernatural. There are forces of hell let loose in this earth that there is only one way to handle them, and it is with the supernatural power of God. I like what Andrew says. He said, if your life is not supernatural, it will be superficial. And you don't want to go for superficial. You want super, I don't know about you, I want all God has for me. Jesus paid for it. It's no skin off his nose. You're not going to cause a power outage in heaven if you believe God for what he's done. He is the all-powerful, almighty God. He's blessed us with all blessings in heavenly places that he wants us to bring into this earth. Can we give the Lord a praise this morning? It's going to be a good one. It's going to be good.